Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Grazing Failed Crops and Stubbles to Maintain Ground Cover. I'm Jodie Rizé O'Brien. Today's webinar is brought to you um, by Sheep Connect South Australia, which is supported by funding from Australian Wool Innovation and also the South Australian Sheep Industry Fund. If you want more information on Sheep Connect, you can go to our website or you can follow us on Twitter. Our presenters for today's webinar are Tiffany Bennett and Michael West, both from Rural Solutions South Australia. Um, Tiffany's based in the southeast of South Australia at our Struan office, and Michael's an agronomist based at our Jamestown office. Um, and I'll hand over to Tiffany to start today's webinar. Thanks, Jodie. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, today's presentation is going to be focusing on uh, grazing failed crops and stubbles uh, in dry conditions, and predominantly we're focusing on trying to maintain uh, ground cover. The season so far across South Australia, um, there's many producers in the state now facing year two or year three of a drought or dry year. Uh, so quite challenging conditions uh, right across the state. Many failed crops um, and marginal crops. Combination of three factors, strong winds, susceptible soils and poor ground cover uh, are certainly making um, some challenging conditions in trying to uh, manage our soils and livestock with a massive drive and a need for feed. So these, those four factors are, are, are really uh, making decisions quite difficult for many producers. Okay. Well, I suppose one of the first decisions we really need to make is, is whether the crop's actually worth harvesting. And uh, I mean, a lot of farmers have already made that decision but I think it needs to be weighed up uh, with the erosion risk. So what is the erosion risk and what's gonna be the, the value or the grazing value you're gonna get from uh, grazing the stubble. So the, the other thing I think that needs to be taken into account is the, the, the total grazing pressure. So if you don't put stock on there, what's the risk of it being grazed by kangaroos, emus or you know, other uh, wild animals? So. I think they are, they are the things that you, you need to uh, factor in. The feed value, um, I guess the quality and quantity um, can be highly variable, both in stubbles and failed crops. And this can be determined by not only crop type, um, but uh, when the rainfall petered out, how much growth you actually got. And, that, and that's going to be very different across the state. I think it's worth noting that... Um, Drought affected crops and stubble um, are very different in their feed value compared to that in a normal year. And that is a result that less energy and protein is deposited in the grain head or the grain heads, grain doesn't fill or form. And therefore a lot of the protein and energy is trapped in the, the stem in the plant itself. Uh, the NDF tends to be lower, um, which is, which is a, a factor of um, how much an animal can fit in. So, those factors um, contribute to drought affected crops and stubble having a much higher feed value and sheep will tend to consume the straw more so than a straw uh, formed from it in a crop or stubble in a normal year. If we break the components up in a, crop, uh, in a failed crop or stubble, the, the main value tends to be in the spilt grain or the grain heads the leaf and the non-toxic weeds that are present. The stem or the trash um, is where the more indigestible or poor quality uh, components sit. Um, and they're typically, and again, this is very variable uh, across paddocks, um, there typically tends to be more stem or trash as a total component of the dry matter in a paddock. I guess weather and header setup will impact on the feed value of stubble or how much grain is available. Um, with wind blowing grain out onto the ground or header set up, um, spitting out whole heads out the back of the, of the header. So those, there's many factors that will, will impact on how much grain is available, um, particularly in a stubble. Here's a small table. Um, so source here is from GRDC, um, which breaks down the different components of a cereal stubble. Um, I think this is quite interesting in you can see that um, digestibility, energy and protein are really high in the green or the grain or the green component uh, of a stubble. And as you can see there, the standing, standing straw or the trash, digestibility, energy and protein are quite low. 
um, and in many cases that would not be um, suffice to to maintain a dry sheet. Okay, now yeah, Tiff has sort of touched on the, the feed value, but other factors I think which we need to, to look at is that obviously summer rain will have an impact on, on quality and it usually uh, declines in, in quality because uh, you get um, some of the protein and, and other nutrients sort of washed out. But also you will get uh, germination of, of grain and summer weeds, which will actually give you better value. Uh, and the other thing I think you need to, to factor in, in in droughted crops is that because I've got higher nitrogen and carbohydrate levels, um, the, they'll be broken down a lot quicker by microbial activity and, and certainly following a rain you'll get so you get combination of moisture uh, and, um, and warm conditions and you'll get quite rapid breakdown of those stubbles. So even if you, you don't graze them or you delayed grazing, and you'll, you'll find that they'll break down a quite, quite a bit quicker than they will in a normal year. The other thing is, is that normally straw alone uh, doesn't maintain uh, a dry sheep. However, I think uh, you know, in a droughted crop or in a failed crop, you know, there is a chance that it, it will go a lot closer to maintaining a, uh, a dry sheep uh, than in a normal year. So, so probably that's a, a situation which is probably a little bit different um, than normal. And uh, if just move on, yeah, thanks Tiff, the, the next slide. These are some figures uh, which have been put together uh, by the Upper North Farming Systems as, as part of a GRDC project, which just shows that the range of energy and protein levels that you can get in different stubbles. And you can see there's, there's quite a range there from for oats, for example, you've got uh, energy of, of six to 7.7. And the average, which is in brackets, is 6.8. So, you know, in a droughted situation, you'll probably be at the, at the higher end, up closer to the 7.7, .7, which is starting to get uh, sort of closer, I suppose, to, to maintenance um, conditions. So you can see there the, the, um, the range of, of sort of um, different crops and certainly if you're getting uh, something like lupins uh, and even um, you know some of the, the peas and, and canola have quite high sort of energy levels and also protein levels. Sheep behaviour uh, has a huge impact on um, on what happens out in the paddock and soil disturbance certainly increases the more that, that sheep walk um, and search for feed and not only feed, water as well. So the greater distance they have to, to walk for water, uh, the more soil disturbance occurs. And it's interesting to note that um, sheep will travel far greater distances in a stubble versus a pasture paddock or a failed crop paddock um, as they search for the spilt grain uh, across the paddock. And therefore, your stubble paddocks can can be at, at a, in a high risk bracket just as a result of, or as a factor of sheep walking greater distances. Low stocking pressures or low numbers out in the paddock um, for longer periods of time uh, increase the risk of erosion as a factor of slower slower grazing. Uh, sheep have more of a chance to camp, um, to bear our areas closer, closer to watering points. So often results in uneven grazing um, as well. So the tax should be higher stocking rates for short periods of time, and that reduces that camping, selective grazing, trampling. So what, one way to, um, uh, yeah, to, to try to uh, increase, uh, you know, reduce the risk of erosion is, is through uh, having smaller, smaller paddocks. Uh, and you can either use uh, electric fencing or other temporary sort of fencing to, to reduce paddock size and to increase uh, grazing pressure, but also to, to fence off high risk areas. So, so your sandy rises, they can be you know, fenced off either, either with uh, electric fencing or just um, cyclone or, or something uh, pretty, pretty simple like that, just to, to keep the stock off those vulnerable areas and, and reduce the risk of um, er erosion sort of down the track. The other way uh, to 
uh, improve grazing is to locate watering points sort of you know, maybe halfway along a fence line uh, or in the center of the paddock so that the stock don't have to, to walk as far and also they're not sort of um, bearing out uh, vulnerable parts of the paddock. And it's also maybe consider worth considering uh, having mobile watering points. Um, these take a little bit to set up, but it certainly uh, gives you a lot uh, better control of your grazing. Uh, and just another point there is you make sure you locate the watering points on, on the heavier soils or on rocky areas where, because you know that the, the stock will camp there uh, and they'll get bared out. So you, so you don't want them on highly erodible areas. When grazing your, your stubbles, it's really important to um, monitor paddocks for your residual grains. And some work done under the Grain and Graze 2 project um, showed that uh, 40, less than 40 kilograms of dry matter per hectare of grain will start to result in weight loss um, in, in livestock. And that project also showed that to maintain weight, you'll need about six to 700 grams of grain per DSE per day. Just to try and evaluate your paddocks, um, the, under that same pro project, the Upper North Farming Systems uh, came up with this really handy, great little table, um, which gives you some estimates using a 32 centimetre by 32 centimetre quadrant, how much um, grains in that quadrant are needed to be equivalent to 100 kilograms of grain per hectare. So you can use this table as a bit of a guide um, if you can get out there um, with a quadrant and count how many grains are in, in that square, um, you can get sort of a, an estimate of, of how many uh, kilograms of grain per hectare you might have in your paddock for different crop types. If you get that information, you can then actually start to calculate some uh, grazing days available for that stubble. Uh, I've just got an example here. Um, of how you might do that. So determine your grain availability. So perhaps use that table, uh, go out and count some grains. Now remember that you want to have 40, or you'll have uh, 40 kilograms per hectare unutilized, because if you push sheep below that, uh, they'll start to have weight loss. So calculate how many um, kilograms of grain you've got per hectare, and minus, take, take out that 40 kilograms per hectare. Then look at um, what animals you're running on that paddock and assign a DSC rating. There's loads of DSC tables available um, on the website or in references um, and assign a DSC rating to that. In this example, I've used a 70 kilogram dry ewe. You then determine the stocking rate. So how many um, of those animals are you putting in and calculate what your DSCs are per hectare. You then calculate um, the grain consumption per hectare. So as I said in the previous slide, um, you'll need 600 to 700 grams um, of grain to maintain a DSC. So I've used the upper end of that to be safer. Uh, so 700 grams times the 7.8 DSCs that I'm running means that they'll be roughly consuming uh, 5.46 kilograms per hectare per day. Then to calculate your available grazing days, um, look, I've calculated that um, we've got 60 kilograms per hectare, um, which, I, which we determined right at the start there, and divide that by how much they're going to consume per hectare per day. So what I've worked out roughly is I've got about 11 grazing days in that paddock. Just on to grazing fail crops, um, I, I guess, with that, you can look at estimating the whole crop biomass or how much how much dry matter there is per hectare and then determine the number of grazing units that you have there. It is quite difficult, I guess, in some instances that um, depending on why the crops failed, I guess, as a, as a result of drought, the sheep may consume most of that straw that you've, you've calculated um, in that total biomass. If the crop is, is more mature and perhaps if failed as a result of frost, then sheep will actually leave a large component of the straw there. So just keep that in mind, I guess, when, when estimating how much uh, dry matter per hectare you have in a paddock um, as, as a factor of perhaps what the quality might be. Was it a lack of moisture or 
you know, the crop did mature and tried to fill. So, you know, the, the straw in there is of a lower quality. I think it's also really important that you check for nitrate levels in failed crops. And certainly there's been some recent reports interstate of um, issues in hay of high nitrate levels causing problems. Um, and particularly in your canola crops, um, sulphur levels can be a problem. So canola is a, it's a bit of a sulphur sponge as a crop um, and easily um, can exceed the 0.4% threshold there in sulphur. Um, many tests that I see, um, you know, are up around the 1% or over um, on sulphur content. So you can test for these two things by sending a sample off away for feed, for feed analyses. Um, and, um, and make sure you're not exceeding those levels for ruminants. It's also really important that you think about um, in your failed crops, uh, your withhold uh, periods and your export slaughter intervals, um, and particularly for crops such as beans where fungicides may have been applied and um, they have quite lengthy withhold periods. So really important um, that you pay attention to, to that uh, as you don't want to be the one uh, sending stock in and um, having some contamination issues. Some other considerations there um, without going too far into depth, I think it's an absolutely essential that you vaccinate at a minimum for pulpy kidney. Um, and ensure that not only is your um, booster up to date, but under a scenario where there is going to be a large grain component that they're consuming, that you might consider an additional um, vaccination, sort of three to four months in addition to the booster, um, and just to make sure you cover yourself there. Uh, might be advisable also um, to supplement some calcium salt for um, sheep grazing cereal crops or stubbles. Uh, just a caution on the salt, I would take do a water test to just make sure that um, you haven't got high sodium chloride levels already being delivered in the water, uh, otherwise you may end up with some salt toxicity issues. Um, if you are grazing lambs to finish on cereals um, and you really want to sort of push them off um, as quick as possible, looking at some additional uh, supplementary protein to those um, would be certainly something to consider. Um, maybe in the form of a legume grain or, or other. And of course, be aware of lupinosis. I know there's some varieties that are supposed to be more tolerant, but any of those uh, lupin, uh, lupin varieties um, are susceptible to, to um, uh, resulting in lupinosis in, in your sheep. Right, I think the, the one of the critical things is really to, to make sure you maintain ground cover when you're grazing uh, you know stubbles and failed crops and so uh, you should maintain ground cover to at least 50 percent uh, you now this is not going to be uh, achievable in all cases but I think once you get below 50 percent I think you have to realize that you know you are going to expose your soil to to erosion so that's the the real aim to, to keep it uh, at 50 percent or, or more and of that at least 30% uh, should be anchored, and especially for for wind erosion, you, you know, anchored uh, stubble is is really critical to to slow the the wind speed and uh, reduce erosion. So, <clears throat> with a standing stubble, um, it needs to be at least you know 10 centimetres high, and and that will give uh, twice as effective. Um, uh, wind erosion as or protection as sort of loose or flat stubble will. Now the the other thing is, is work done by uh, DPI in Western Australia has uh, indicated that that sheep can detach up to 300 kilograms of uh, hard setting soil uh, per week and up to a ton of sandier soil. So obviously, you know, just by them walking around, they're going to loosen that. And that's going to be then susceptible to erosion. So and I think the the other issue is that uh, some work's been done that that by not maintaining ground cover um, you know, the, through through erosion, you can get uh, significant reduction in, in nutrient or removal of nutrients and uh, yield penalties in in following years and in, in really severe cases. There's been reports of even up to 25% yield losses. 
So there's more information can be available uh, or is available on managing stubbles. And one really good site is the Mali Mali Sustainable Farming Systems website. Uh, and they have some good publications, uh, one on stubble management, um, and a guide for Mali farmers, and another one, know your ground cover. So, um, and there's just a, a, a photograph there from, from one of the guides. So that's some uh, good information that can be followed up on. The, the other thing that we need to, to consider is when do you actually look at removing you know, stock from, from the stubble or, or, or the failed crop? Uh, so as we talked about earlier, you know, once the, um, the amount of grain falls below 40 kilograms per hectare, uh, then, then they're not going to be able to, to uh, get enough grain or enough nutrients to maintain body weight, so they'll start to lose weight. So that's one trigger. And the other one is the, the minimum of 50% ground cover. So the, the other thing you need to look at is, um, you know, hot spots or hazard spots where, where you know, sheep have been camping, um, where you've had uh, areas which are, you know, have low ground cover and are already exposed. Um, so quite often they're the areas where the sheep will camp first. Uh, and also gateways and watering points, which seem to be um, hammered more by the, the stock. Um, and they are the sort of the areas that you'll need to, to keep an uh, eye on. And if they start to get bare, well, then that's a trigger to, to move stock. The other thing is, or the other way to do is to, is to monitor their weight, uh, either by weighing them or doing condition scoring. So what do we do if um, ground cover gets that critical 50% or um, they, are, they start to lose weight? Well, I think start looking at some other livestock management techniques. So many people now have confinement feeding setups of some description, might be purpose-built facilities or incorporating existing facilities or the use of a sacrifice paddock. Um, and these should be set up on a, in a low risk area that's, that's not going to erode. Uh, adjustment's another opt option. I think in the last couple of years, given where livestock prices are sitting, where adjustment um, would normally be available, most people um, are running their own uh, animals uh, as it's more, more profitable to run their own than to take an adjusted stock and the risks associated with that. So, but if you can find it, um, yeah, a, a great option. Selling animals, uh, I think, you know, a lot of people have probably sold what they wanted to sell um, by now and uh, their remaining animals they're hoping to, to hold on to, um, given the concerns of the right widespread nature of this drought, um, whether they will be available to purchase back in and if so, at what price uh, will they be available at. Um, Another thing that you could probably consider is, um, you know, having areas designated that are set up with either perennial pastures or shrubs. Um, and those areas are set aside um, to put stock into. Uh, in many cases, they'll still require some sort of um, supplementary feeding, but um, they're areas that, you know, as a result of the perennials um, planted there, um, they're sort of safe, safe areas to be held together. Um, so there's some areas that some people sort of said they've got salt bush planted, which become a cross between a confinement feeding setup, um, and it's quite a sheltered sheltered area for for sheep. In summary, um, I think the key points: um, look at that 40 kilograms of dry matter per hectare, and and when stubble paddocks reach that threshold, um, there's no point in keeping them in there. Stock are going to lose weight unless you're going to keep that paddock as a sacrifice paddock, um, in which which state you'll you'll need to start supplementary feeding. Monitor sheep weight uh, or condition score. Look at your ground cover. Uh, once that reaches 50, a minimum of 50%, um, remove animals. And of that ground cover, always ensure that 30% of that is anchored. Where possible, do a feed budget um, to give you a bit of a guide on, on how much feed um, or the value of the feed that you, you're going to have in front of you. Um, doing basic feed budgets can help you understand how many days of grazing you are actually going to get out of your stubble or your failed crop 
and um, when you need to go to find an alternative way of feeding and managing those stock moving forward. So thank you everybody for listening. Um, thank you to Michael for co co presenting with me, and I will hand back to Jody now. Thanks, Tiff. Um, thanks to everyone who's joined us for today's presentations. Um, I extend my thanks to Michael and Tiff for sharing their insight and expertise. If you've got any questions that you'd like to ask of Tiff or Michael, please contact the Sheep Connect team directly through our website or you can email me. Um, thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>